All right, everyone. Great to see you all here today. Welcome to another episode of the Peyton Pipette Podcast. I am joined today by legendary management guru, Liz Wiseman. Thank you for joining me today, Liz. Oh, my absolute pleasure to be here. I am so stoked to have this conversation. I can't wait to uh, to dive in. I wanted to start with something you said right at the beginning, uh, or while we were just kind of warming up here, uh, warming up our vocal cords. Um, you said you've spent the last 15 years trying to control your idea flow. And for anybody who's a part of my community, you know that's a topic obviously near and dear to my heart. So tell me what you mean by trying to control your idea flow. I got to understand that more. Well... So my mind generates ideas and like it grabs onto problems. So, you know, when you talk about idea flow starts with quantity, not quality. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with the quantity side of this. Like I'm, I'm the kind of person who I remember in college, I was given the brick exercise in a class, you know, what could you do with the brick? And I remember looking at the other students. Well, tell people what that is. If people don't know the brick exercise, what, what is it? The brick is exercise is if you had a brick, like what are all the things that you could do with that brick? You know, and people start with, you can build a wall, like you can throw it at someone, you can grind it up. So I was watching as I'm madly writing things down. I was watching other students in the class, like scratching their heads. And, and I'm thinking, I just can't write fast enough. So (laughs) like ideas just flow from me. I love ideas. I like you say brainstorm. I'm in idea flow. I want to be part of it. And, but it's posed some challenges for me, not as a creator. It's an incredible asset as a creator. Hmm. And part of my job is to create. I'm a researcher. I'm an author. I'm a teacher. But as a leader, Oh, it can create some problems. So what, what kind of problems do you see it create for you? Well, let me give you sort of, uh, here's the youth use case. Like this would be a typical problem. So I began, like I spent the first half of my career as an executive at, at Oracle. And I had this sweet corner office and, you know, there's a lot of traffic and people would, you know, and I ran a fairly large function there. I ran all the education, the university function. And people would pop into my office with like, hey, Liz, guess what? You know, that program we've been working on, we just ran a pilot or, hey, this new campaign. And people would pop in to give me progress. Uh And I would get excited by it. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's okay, great. Like, have you thought about this? Have you considered looping this person in? Or what about this? Or how about this? Mm. And I would notice that they would come into my office sparkly. And they would leave flat. (laughs) So like, to speak. Like, like you've taken up a carbonated water and then just let all the fizz out kind of a thing. Yeah. And it's that and confused. It's dazed and confused. It's like, mm. what does she, what is, what was that? What just happened there? Right, like, I was, right. Am I supposed to do all of that now? Or? Am I supposed to do that? Uh-huh. Am I supposed to like create a task force or consider this or that? And to me, I'm just having fun. Right, like, right. I'm excited. Like, let's ideate together. And they're now confused. And right. this didn't happen once or twice. This happened all the time. Hmm. And I started to notice this. And, you know, eventually I, um, I put a big sign on my door. Uh, so my door was... It wasn't supposed to be a whiteboard, but you know, if you're kind of a creative thinker, anything that could be a whiteboard becomes a whiteboard. Totally. And uh, so I just took a big whiteboard marker. I had written like our three top priorities as an organization. And then I put a big block letters, ignore me as needed to get your job done. (laughs) That's so good. Because what, like my love of the creative process and considering alternatives and what ifs was really distracting to people. Yeah, and sure. It was diminishing to people because now they're confused. Um, so I've had to do a lot to, to, to make sure that like my need or desire to generate doesn't create vibration in the organization. It doesn't create confusion. Um, I've adopted a whole bunch of practices so that I don't become the idea of fountain yeah. that like drowns out everyone's creativity. And, and it's actually one of the things that 
I've, I've tried to really study when we look at like leaders who have a multiplying versus diminishing effect on others and the ways that we end up accidentally diminishing, you know, one of them is the idea fountain who's like idea rich, but they're like, they've got so much of this idea flow that nobody else needs to like their ideas become anchor points, their right. ideas end conversations, not start conversations. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can become very idea lazy around people who are idea rich. Right, right. And and so like, I've learned like, what you want is you want max idea flow and creativity on your team. Right. And what that means is that the leader doesn't get to maximize her own. Right, right. Yeah. And yeah, you have to be willing very to different role. You know, that's, that reminds me of something that uh, Astro Teller said. He was on a few months back and he talked about at Google X, he always requires teams to bring five ideas, not just one. They have to have five solutions. And he said, you know, a lot of times they, they think they can game the system. They bring, you know, their, their pet idea and then four dummy ideas. Mm. Um, but he said, what, what happens is half the time, one of their dummy ideas is better than their pet idea oh, and they don't even fun. realize it. You know, but the point there, the flip being he's he puts the the burden for alternative generation on the team. It's not about his alternatives. It's about their alternatives. And I think that's actually one maybe reframe. One of the things that I found with a, with a lot of leaders is there's a tendency to think they have to be the answer gal or the answer guy. Right. And then and especially if you're an idea generator like yourself, then that's it's it's not even a burden. It's a gift. Right. To be the answer gal. It's like I got lots of answers. Right. But to shift to being the approach guy or the approach gal is a very different um, mindset. How did you like one thing I'd be curious about if you think about even your own organization now, you've got a team that's looking to make as magnified an impact as possible. How do you, one, check your own kind of impulse to generate, but then two, simultaneously actually cultivate the team's ability to generate alternatives? Mm. Yeah, it's it's about moving from being like the fountain of ideas um, to being maybe the, the gardener and the cultivator mm. of ideas. And, you know, there's a bunch of things I've learned to do differently. Uh, one is I've learned to shift out of the mode of giving answers and, and operate in the mode of asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think this is perhaps the most important shift that leaders make um, as they mature is to realize that, you know, if your job is to dole out answers to the organization, it means that your team can only solve problems that you yourself have solved previously. Right. Right. Exactly. Which rules out most of the work that we're doing today. Right. And, you know, like I remember, like I remember the moment actually when I made this shift and um, it was actually not a bad day at work. It was, I'm at work and I'm sort of processing kind of not a bad day at home, but like a bad era. I've got three young kids at the time. They're like, six, four, and two. I've got this big job at Oracle, but I've got a bigger job at home with young kids. And I happened to tell my buddy, Brian, you know, I'm like, man, I don't feel like I'm being a very good parent right now because I am bossing orders. Like I am constantly barking orders, telling my kids what to do. It doesn't feel good for me. I can relate. By the way, I can relate. You're, you're, you're preaching the choir here. Kids? How Go old on. are your daughters? My daughters are 11, nine, six, and three. I love that. And I love the way your face lights up when you mention that. So I'm in that phase. There's six, four, two, you know, life at home is chaos. And I'm telling Brian, I'm like, man, I feel like I've become this bossy, this bossy mom. And he said, oh, you don't seem like the bossy type. I'm like, Brian, let me describe bedtime at my house. <laughs> and so uh, you, you probably know how this goes. Now it might go differently for you, but for me, it was like kids, kids, time for bed, put that away, leave, leave her alone, get your pajamas on, go brush your teeth, you know, go back, use toothpaste this time. Uh, you know, okay, story Why time. Why is there oh, toothpaste in your hair? Why yeah. is there toothpaste in your hair? Yeah, get get that toothbrush wet. Okay, you know, and and then it's like story time, get a book. No, not five books, no big books. Give me a little book. Okay, done. Story time. Say, say your prayers in a bed, not my bed, not yeah. You know, and there's no yelling. It's this barrage right, right. of telling. 
telling them what to do. And Brian said to me, so he offers this little bit of coaching. Brian has two young daughters of his own. Mm -hmm. And he said, and, and, and of course, I wasn't looking for coaching. You know, this was purely recreational complaining, purely. <laughs> but he offers this little tidbit of coaching. He says, well, why don't you go home and just try asking your kids questions? Now, he claims he never meant this to be what I took it to be, because I call this the extreme question challenge, because I took it to its extreme. My first reaction was impossible. Like, that's not going to work. I'm not, they're not going to go to bed from me asking them questions. Right, right. No past data would lead me to believe this. But then I decided that's, that's interesting. Like, could I actually only ask questions? So that night, you know, I, I get home, I sort of summon the courage to go inside my house. And, you know, it wasn't hard to get through dinner and sort of playtime afterwards, but now it's bedtime, the witching hour. And I'm having to figure out like, how would I guide them through this? And at first, like the questions aren't coming, but then it's like, and I started with like, okay, kids, what time is it? Hmm. Like your 11 year old knows what time to totally. go to bed. Totally. And then it was, okay, um, who needs help getting their pajamas on? Um, you know, uh, who's going to be the first to get their teeth brushed tonight? Uh, wha what story were you going to read tonight? Whose turn is it to pick the story? You know, who do you want to have read the story, mom or daddy? Um, you know, what do we do after story time? Oh, mom, we say our prayers. And I'm like, what? And then, Wait, I didn't have to bark orders at you? This is incredible. Yeah, and then my final question was like, okay, who's ready for bed? And then it became this contest, like who could get in their beds first and they got in their mm. beds, they went to sleep on their own, they stayed in their beds. And I'm left like alone wondering what just happened and <laughs> what's happening to my kids. And of course it was nothing that was happening to my kids. It was entirely happening to me. You know, and I'm wondering how long have they known how to do this? Right. Exactly. <laughs> and why have I been taking this up? So bring this into the workplace for a second, because you say that flip, you know, from answers to questions, what's an example of maybe, maybe a current project where you've taken the approach of asking a question instead, oh. just because, I mean, th by the way, it's all the more poignant in the home. So, it's, so I, I'm already thinking about it in my house. But what does it look like when someone, like, what kind of challenge is someone coming to you with right now, where responding with a question actually draws out someone's creativity? Well, this challenge changed me as a parent, of course, but it really changed me as a corporate manager, and it changed me as a leader, and it helped me see that. Your value as a leader is not to come up with the ideas. It's not to give the answers. It's to ask the question that get other people finding solutions to the problem. And, you know, it's, it's asking the questions that crisp up the problem statement for other people to solve. And, you know, I used to be the kind of leader who would toss out a few ideas to get the conversation going. And Jeremy, you of all people know the danger of that. You know, when you make, and, yeah. they become the anchors to those conversations, they're good enough. The boss already like is okay with it. So let's just go with that. And, you know, I really shifted to like, let me ask, let me ask the question that defines the problem we're trying to solve. Hmm. And, you know, I, I, I've done this hundreds of times. I've seen hundreds of people do it. I've seen uh, thousands of people say like, this has changed me as a leader. Um, I think it was one example of um, actually someone that was in a class I taught at, at Stanford and he went back and started practicing this. He's a, you know, PhD chemist who leads an organization that's running a massive project to clean up a toxic waste dump on the East coast. And it's the kind of project that's a multi-year, like multi-decade project. Mm -hmm. And when I saw him last, he was so excited. He said, you know, these ideas 
and like learning to ask the questions and not give answers. He said, we just shaved. And I, I can't remember exactly. Eight is the number coming to mind. Eight or nine years off our project. No way. How long was it going to take? It was like a 20 plus year project. And they like, we just found ways like that. And it comes when the leader doesn't tell people what to do, but like, this is the problem we're trying to solve and yeah. engages the intelligence of everyone on the team. And, you know, I've learned not to toss out the few first few ideas. I've learned to like sharpen up a question, define a problem. Um, I've learned to offer my ideas and clarify the difference between hard opinions and soft opinions. Yeah. Well, can I, so this is kind of unexpected, but one thing I'd say is I think it's actually not dissimilar from the challenges people have with generative AI. This is going to, mm. it seems like a tangent, but it's totally mm. not. I've been doing a small, not your scale research study, which is, you know, statistically significant, et cetera. But I've made it through 14 years in academia without ever doing research. And now I got a friend at Harvard who's wrote me into this research project where basically we're studying the impact of generative AI on collaboration and teamwork. We've done, we've conducted a couple of studies, um, kind of, you know, control group not using AI and then research group using AI. We've done this in a couple places. We have a couple more lined up, but uh, and so the the, the result that you can't say results because it's still early days. But Liz, you'll you'll be maybe not surprised at all to know one of the things that we see happening. Like we're some of the things we're measuring on the outcome side of the equation are how many ideas are people generating to solve mm -hmm. the problems? You know, right? How, what's the quality of the ideas people are generating, um, and how do they feel about generating ideas? Or, or about the, the task of solving a problem with the team, right? What's crazy uh, to me or relative to my expectation, because of course I expect Gen AI, it's like, you can tell it to come up with a thousand ideas. It'll do it, right? It says it has no fatigue whatsoever. Um, but if you compare the control group, which doesn't have AI with the research group, the research group systematically, at least so far, generates less ideas. And you know, it's crazy. They, uh, if you ask like the problem owner to grade, you know, A, B, C, D, the ideas that the solutions that the team generates, there is a broader distribution of grades in the non AI group than in the AI group. And you know where the bulk of the grades are in the AI group is in the B category. Hmm. It has fewer A's, fewer D's, which by the way, I think is a problem. You probably know that. Um, but a lot more Bs. And we've kind of been wondering, why is that? And I think it re is related all that to come back to your point. I think AI gives good enough solutions early enough that the team goes, well, why add to that? That's, that's good enough. And, and now we have three pages of documentation. Let's just do that. <clears throat> well, and, you know, I'm no AI expert, of course, but, you know, based on what I know is it it's working with knowns things that have already been established show not as good at things that don't exist, mm. you know, and that's where you're going to get your AI ideas, which is, you know, combining things in a way that don't exist. Right. And, right. and, you know, I guess maybe another analogy about from AI is like, you know, the answers are only as good as the prompts. Mm. And Let's I think the question. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what I've learned is like, if you want a team that generates good ideas, and goes through this process that that you um, <clears throat> and Perry have laid out. It's like it. The leader has a very different role than just a team member. Like you become the one who decides like what we need to take to that process, mm. and you have to be a framer of this. Like you've got to be more like the framer than the painter. Like right. you're the one that stretches the canvas. And says, like, this is the size of it. This is what we need. You assemble the paintbrushes. Like, you maybe, you get people going, but you are not the chief painter of it. Um, otherwise, you get solutions that look like the kinds of solutions you've you've already had. And, right. you know, it's funny. When I, um, when I st started studying these multiplying versus diminishing leaders, mm -hmm. you know, what I saw were these leaders... <clears throat> who were diminishers, who, who look like kind of power mongers, like 
tyrannical, narcissistic, bully, know-it-all, I have the answer, I have the way. But what I found is that actually, you know, it, it wasn't that people were diminishing others, like slowing down innovation and creativity <clears throat> because they were, <clears throat> excuse me, power hungry. It was because they didn't understand their own power. Mm. They didn't realize how much power they wield. And how much they, how much room they're taking up, it sounds like, probably. Oh, yeah, that they're taking up a lot of space conceptually and that, you know, they don't realize that a comment from them can translate into a command. Right. And I right. would see this from executives all the time, like where they would learn that there was like this task force that was doing something and they're like, and they're like, yeah, you told us to do this. Well, no, I just mentioned that we might want to think about about yeah, that right right and and they're underestimating the ripple effect of their their power and you know and i've had to go through this myself because ideas come too easily to me mm -hmm. like, no that's not the job the job is to get the numbers working for you mm -hmm. you've got a team of 10 people do you want a bunch of ideas you know from one person or do you want everyone generating like 10x on 10 people and then 10x in right. that like then right. you get to the numbers you talk about right which is the kind of table stakes right to ultimately succeed so how do you so one one um uh, one thing i've been curious about since digesting impact players um without kind of getting into the broad specifics too much or the, the broad kind of framing too much um but it's related to this i found for myself as i was interacting with the framework a slight tension, I would say, between um, one of the one of the principles you that you uh, put forth is they do what needs to be done, the job that needs to be done, right? An impact player doesn't just do their job; they do the job that needs to be done, which I love. Um, and th so there's a tension between that, and then also uh, I don't know if it's impact players, maybe it's multipliers too. I, but I remember somewhere in the back of my mind, you talked about how. Um, managers often aren't the people who know what needs to be done, right? Or, or there, there's a value to a beginner's mindset, to a novice mm. mindset, to, to someone who, who isn't, you know, uh, jaded by the past, right? And I wondered, I, I would love for you to speak to how does, how does one, uh, you know, maybe start from an individual contributor perspective. Um, so not the manager perspective, but the individual contributor, because you've spoken quite eloquently in Impact Players about, you know, do what needs to be done. And, and yet I, I find myself often uh, not necessarily opposite, but I find myself telling novices, you know, your perspective is valuable because you see something nobody else can see. How do you, how do you think about managing that tension? Mm -hmm. or, or does it, does that strike you in any way? I don't know. It could, maybe it's a, maybe it's a false dichotomy, but it's just something that was coming to my mind as I was reading the book. Okay. So this is a fun, delicious question for me because it combines like three different research projects that I've done three different books, okay. but here's what we found about the impact player. So the, the, the study we did that led up to this is we wanted to know like, what are the most influential, impactful value contributing people doing different than other people? And, you know, in this study, we looked at the ordinary contributor right. who's doing a rock solid job right. versus They're the doing impact their job. Yeah. And, and what we found is that the difference is really how they deal with the messy stuff, mm. you know, and particularly five areas like messy problems, unclear roles, unforeseen obstacles, unrelenting demands, moving targets. Like I call these the everyday challenges because, you know, in the modern workplace, these are the kinds of things we're encountering every day and everywhere. And we found that the impact players really handle these kind of daily tough things differently than other people. Mm -hmm. And the first is how they handle these messy problems. What we find is when a problem lacks a clear owner, it's not your job. It's not in your job description. It's not my job description. It's not that department star. It's not this. It's like that messy stuff in the middle. It's the jump really ball. It's a loose ball. It is. It's a loose ball. It's it's something that's annoying the customers. It's mm. it's ill defined. And you know our org structures inside of 
you know, our organizations, all the job descriptions, it's all built for the past. Right. Right. So everybody can look at that thing and go, not it. Not yet. Not my problem. Yeah. Not mine. Not mine. But, you know, our, those org charts are built and workflows are for how we handle things in the past. This is like stuff, problems of the future. What we find in this situation is that the ordinary contributor, they do their part. They do their job. They do their job well. But in some ways, it's like they're doing their job so well. They're like heads down doing their job that they don't see that there's a job to be done and right. it's nobody's job. We find that the most influential people are the ones that step out of the confines of their job description. They ignore swim lanes <clears throat> and workflows and levels and hierarchies, and they go do the job that's needed. But to do this, like you, you under, you need to understand like, what is the job that's needed? Yeah, I, that's actually one of my questions here is how do you identify the job that needs to be done? Yeah. And so it's, you, I've heard you give the example of you know, your boss at some point, just not, not to interrupt. I apologize. But I've heard you give the example of your boss saying, Liz, we need this program. Like, do it. That I would say that's a gift. If, if a boss has the wherewithal to say the job that needs to be done is blank, then, then you're probably in like a very special class. To me, a lot of times the job that needs to be done isn't um, you, you probably don't have the gift of a boss who says, go do this. So yeah, what, I, what do you do as an individual contributor when it's not when, when nobody's telling you what to do? Yeah. Like early in my career, I learned this lesson because I had this I was advocating for this job I wanted. I wanted to teach leadership and I'm interviewing for this group that runs these technical boot camps and I'm making this case. Oracle needs a management boot camp and I'd love to build it. And he's like. Yeah, we think you're great, but your boss has a different problem. Right. We don't have to figure yeah, out how to get 2,000 technologists up to speed in the Oracle technology stack over the next year. And what would be terrific, Liz, is if you could help her figure out how to do that. So, in some ways, he kind of gave me a little slap on the well, What do you do if you don't have the person giving you the slap, right? Like, how right. do you discover the job that needs to be done when nobody, when, as you said, like sometimes it's a jump ball or it's a loose ball and it's, Nobody even realizes the thing that we need to do is blank. Right. Well, first of all, and, and I repeated that because like I had to pay attention to what he, he never said, don't do that. Mm. We, this is what we want you to do. What he just said is he pointed to a hot spot. Mm. He pointed to somebody else's problem. And he said, your boss has a different problem. Mm. And so I'm like, oh, what he was essentially saying is like, look around and make yourself useful which is the two-step process of figuring this out. What it trained me to do is to look for hotspots. Hmm. You know, every- How do you define hotspots? Hotspots, hot topics. What are the things that are getting talked about in the hallways, you know, in company-wide emails and town halls? What are um, hot projects, projects that are getting funding? projects that are getting resourced what are um hot buttons like what what's your boss grumbling about mm -hmm. um my daughter um uh worked at sanford in a lab and she told me she said mom you know um my boss was saying like when we do these blood draws you know in this research lab like why aren't we using like vr technology and her boss just kept sort of mumbling about that. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, I need you to go do this. It was not on a project. She just noticed that her boss kept bringing it up and was an, like just angsty. Yeah, and yeah. it was not my daughter's job, but she's like, mom, I think that's what you talked about. Like the job that's needed. Like, I think my okay. boss was, Again, my daughter didn't get asked. My daughter Amanda didn't get asked. She just said, you know what? I'm going to go and investigate how we can use VR technology to, you know, distract the youth that were going through this, this study at Stanford, like these young people who were going through this study, like to distract them during the blood draws and this. And she said, I just went and talked to this person and that person. I put it together. Can, can you imagine her boss's reaction when she no. came back and said, you know, I noticed you were talking about VR technology. So I just took it upon myself. She's like... And, and, and her, the comment her boss made was, this is what leadership looks like. Mm, wow. This is initiative. Wow. See, like the most important problems, rarely do we get handed. Yeah. 
on like a job platter. I love that. I love the tip of what is the, the what is someone mumbling about? You know that, and to me, it's it's it, it's. I'll never forget. I, I thought of this um, memory from my own career. I started my career at the Boston Consulting Group. Mm -hmm. And I was a summer intern. So it's, I went to the University of Texas at Austin, Hookham, and I was working in the Dallas office. My dad, I didn't have a car. My dad worked in downtown Dallas. I was living with my parents. And so I would ride to work with my dad every day. And by the way, cherished memories. Great. I don't know how he feels. We would drive through McDonald's, get a bacon, egg and cheese biscuit every morning, you know, and just have 45 minutes in the car. And, I'll, and I was doing terribly at BCG. I was like the worst associate ever. And I didn't like the job. There's all sorts of problems. But my dad, I'll never forget. I can't even remember the whole like context. But you, were, I was reminded of this story actually reading your book because there's a day where my dad said, Jeremy, you got to make sure you leave that meeting with the monkey on your back. Mm. Don't let anybody else leave with the monkey on their back. And there was, there was something about, it. and I, I find, I, I don't know why exactly, because it doesn't map one-to-one, -one, but there's something about, I have to take responsibility for something that I could easily say isn't my job. Right. And these messy problems don't have owners. And so it's about taking yeah. ownership. So it's, it's figuring out what's important, pay attention to heat. It's almost like the impact players move through their work world with a heat map. Mm -hmm. Oh, hot issue, hot project. Oh, we need a hot take on this. Like, where is their heat? And then they become like a heat seeking missile. So they're figuring out like first step, figure out what's important. And if you can't figure it out by paying attention, just ask, Hey, mm -hmm. what's like, don't ask what's keeping you up at night, which is what's something that's like on your top priority that you haven't been able to get to. Yeah. How can yeah. I contribute? So it's figuring out what's important. And then here's the, the second step, make it important to you. Hmm. You know, I didn't want to teach technology right. to a bunch of nerds. I wanted to teach leadership. Like that was what was important to me. But what I decided to do, and that was early in my career, it set the tone for so much of how I worked is, you know what, if that's the most important problem, and it's like on the critical path of the company's growth, I'm going to make it important to me. I'm going to like love that technology. And I'm mm -hmm. going to, um, and so it's saying like, I'm going to take this thing and put it on the top of my list. And something kind of magical happens when you figure out what's important and you make it important to you. you just start to get more and more responsibility. And let me give you another example. I was um, doing some team teaching with someone. This was um, a community class where teaching is for uh, this thing for teenager. And so my co teacher and I, we sit down at the beginning of our work together. And I say like, what's important to you as we start this. And I'm expecting this big vision of like what his aspirations for the students were. And he said, well, what's important to me is that we start class on time and we wear like professional attire. Like we're going to be with like teenagers in the morning. Mm -hmm. Like they're rolling in and sweatpants. And he's like that we, you know, wear suits. And, and I'm thinking of, if I made a list of 200 things that were important to me, right? neither of those are going to show up on that list. And I decided, you know what, if those two things are important to Eric, my partner in this, I'm going to make those important to me. I'm going to start class on time and I'm going to come dressed to impress, I suppose. And you know, what's funny. And neither of those did I want to do, but I did them. And you can imagine every harebrained idea I had. Like when I decided, you know what, we had to do a dunk tank and we had to let the students dunk the teachers if we get the answers wrong on this. And you know what, we had to, and I'm like, these are wild harebrained things that most people would say, no. Uses, un unconventional uses of the brick. Unconventional uses of the brick. Every single one of them, Eric said, you know, this is like Eric who wants to start on time and wear a suit. He's like, let's do it. That's cool. When I found that the things that were then important to me, mm. he made those important to him. Triggered reciprocity. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Here, so here's a question I have for you, especially for folks who are joining organizations in this 
uh, uh, you know, remote or hybrid environment, because you've, you've mentioned, you know, um, hearing what's what people are talking about in the in the halls. There's another uh, in, in a talk of yours I was watching, you mentioned kind of unwritten rules of an organization sometimes are, you know, really important. I wonder if you could speak for a moment to how do you learn the unwritten rules or the hot topics when when you're new and when you're remote? Because it strikes me that you're at somewhat of a disadvantage. I mean, and that doesn't mean you're young in your career. You may be more senior, but you you start in a new organization. Say it's remote or hybrid. How do you? What are the what are the means by which one starts to learn some of the unwritten rules and learn about the hot topics when your kind of standard ways of doing so, you know, the water cooler, proverbial water cooler, aren't as available to you? Mm. Well, I, I like to think of this as like, how do you learn a culture? And, you know, you look at it, it's like, what's typical here? Like, what do people typically dress like? You know, you think about when you go into a new country and you're unfamiliar with the culture, you're paying attention to all sorts of norms about where do people walk on the sidewalks and, you know, who pauses for whom and all of the things. But I like to think of it more like um, kind of a tribe. And like, what's at the center of the tribe? Like, you know, typically there would be like a meeting house or a hut, sort of like, you um, mm kind of at the heart of the community. And then what are the boundaries of the community? And I like to think of it like, okay, what's valued here? And what gets people sort of in trouble here versus what gets people promoted here? And, 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 you know, in some ways I'm looking at like, what brings people, like what gets people promoted or what, you know, what is it that people do here that causes them to like get ahead or to build influence or power like that's what's bringing them to the center of that tribe. Yeah. yeah. And then like, what gets people tossed out? You know, what, what would get you kicked out of the community here? Um, and I think when you do that, you start to learn the unwritten rules of an organization. Mm. And that, and that you could learn in, you know, coffee chats, you know, never, I would say to young folks, especially never underestimate the power of reaching out and asking someone for advice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, folks in organizations actually love getting asked for advice and you might feel reticent to do it, but it's such a simple way to build camaraderie. And to, if you're equipped with a couple of questions, like Liz is suggesting, you, you can actually really build your reservoir of knowledge about the organization. I like that phrase, learning culture. Okay. I wanted to share with you one thing, Liz, that, um, and then I want to move to a couple of rapid fire questions because I know we're close on time from members of our television audience. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I wanted to mention to you, and I would love to hear if you thought about context at all, I'll just use that word context, um, because it struck me that a lot of impact players, it kind of, it's somewhat agnostic of context. What can you do to, you know, outperform. And the reason I thought about that word context is a few years ago, I had the opportunity to teach a class with Lazlo Bach, who at the time was the head of people ops at Google. I think he's since moved on to Humu and other mm -hmm. places. But one of the things I remember him saying to our class, it was, you know, 20 or 30 MBA students. And he said, they, you know, do deep kind of data driven people operation stuff at Google. And he said, the single greatest predictor of someone's performance, good or bad, was actually context. And he said what that and what the implications are is if somebody's a high performer, do not move them because their performance reverts to the mean mm -hmm. in a new context. Meaning, the, uh, he said, like you can even in their studies have shown like, you know, a, a top performing team of five investment bankers at Goldman, if they get acquired and go to J.P. Morgan, their returns revert to the mean once they're at J.P. Morgan. I'm using this hypothetical, right? But then he said the flip is also true that if you take a low performer he said, what we've learned at Google is always move them before firing them. Because if you move them, their performance reverts to the mean. And by the way, the mean at Google is pretty great, right? And so rather than fire someone first, move them because chances are their failure to perform is also a function of context. So anyway, I would love to know how you, all that being said, how you think about this, the intersection between call it impact players and the stuff that you can do agnostic of context and the role that context plays in contributing to or detracting from someone's ability to be an impact player. Mm. Okay. Well, let me start with maybe the obvious thing. And then I want to move to some less obvious and maybe even a controversial, controversial view of it. Hot take. Think, love it. Hot takes. Okay. Um, maybe the, the, the most um, in, intuitive is, 
you know, if you can't get, we've got to talk about the impact players, they find out what's important and they make it important to them. That's one of the five things they do differently. If you can't make that work important to you, you might need to work in a different context. Like there are certain things, like if you put me in certain environments, I'm like, oh, I'm having a hard time getting jazzed about this. Mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head, wanting to be creative. I'm perfunctory going through the motion. Sometimes a change of context is just what people need. Like, yeah, now that ignites my passion or my, I have some natural talent or native genius for that kind of work. I've seen this happen dozens of times where someone was a low performer and you get them into um, a new role and boom, they, they just go. Up. Yeah. Okay. Let me then, then go to the thing that might be a little bit more counterintuitive is it might not be the content of the context. It might be a fresh start that People get inside of teams and organizations and they fall into roles, kind of like family dynamics and patterns. Oh, that's the maverick. Oh, this is the one that can never, you know, make it to, you know, on time. And, and people assume those roles and they get in those well-worn tracks of their roles. And sometimes being able to pop off to a new team, it's mm, not it about be a chance to reestablish re who you are, your identity. Yeah. It's going from like your high school senior year to your first year in college is a chance to define a new you. And so, you know, one of the things that sucks about work is that there aren't these semesters and years like work can just right. go on and on. And we get in these ruts and tracks like one of the things good managers do is they create finite points like, OK, we started this. We ended it. Let's celebrate it. Semesters over fresh start. So giving people fresh starts in projects within a team is healthy, but giving people fresh starts in an organization, like, you know what? No one knows that you were struggling mm -hmm. in this last thing. Like this is a chance to rebuild. Mm, that's great. <clears throat> okay, I want to, I want to shift to a couple of questions <laughs> from, uh, from listeners. So okay. uh, Anna Leva asked great questions. So there's two and I'll, I'll give you the two questions and you can choose which order. Anna Leva, who's one of my favorite students and who's become a dear friend of mine as well uh, from her time at the GSB. And then now we're part of the same church and she's, she's incredible. She asked the question, how do you identify impact players in the hiring process? Mm. Okay. That's one question. And then Bill King, who's a former DCI fellow, and uh, he's the founder of Movi Community, is an incredible uh, leader and banker and, and investor. He said, we all want to be impact players. He texted me this question, so I'm reading here. We all want to be impact players. However, sometimes life gets in the way and we slip back to being a contributor. What mental model, by way of reminder, framing, et cetera, do you recommend for us to look through to show up every day as an impact player? Oh, go. I love these questions. And you want fast responses on them. Oh, you know, call it 42 seconds. I'm kidding. Okay, I'm kidding. 42 Take seconds. Your... Set the timer. <laughs> um, part of the research we did, we looked at all the traits, the characteristic of impact players, and then put them through the lens of some of these are learnable. And some of these are a little bit more inherent. Like we come to our work with this, like you want to hire for some of the ones that are here. If I had to pick the two that I was hiring for, I would pick a very strong sense of agency. People who take charge, you know, maybe someone who takes charge of the interview process. Okay, who should I talk to next? What would you like to see me? I, I took the liberty of putting this together, like even border on annoying take charge. Mm, okay. The second thing I would look for is comfort with ambiguity. And um, I'll give you one of the tip from one of my buddies. I asked him to um, test out a, a hiring tool that I had been building, like, I, you know, he was going to hire a bunch of impact players. And so he was looking for people who are comfortable with ambiguity. And what he noticed is that when he asked people, like, tell me about a time when you had to deal with a really messy problem that was unclear, a lot of uncertainty. Some people would kind of like, oh boy. Okay. Let me tell you versus some were like, okay, well, let me tell you. Ah, it's almost like what, what is the, what is the premise of ambiguity? Um, stimulate for the recipients. It's not even it about, it's just about the, the visceral response. Is it like, no. okay, I'm going to tell you about my trauma from this. Versus, right. <laughs> oh man, this thing was like a delicious mess. And yeah, exactly. Oh, man, Is it no therapy or a bragging thing. session? Yeah. And, and he noticed it was like a leaning thing. Hmm. And Definitely. if I had to pick two, those would be the two, two that um, 
I would. No, that's brilliant. For. That's you know, uh, you saying agency one maybe a sh super short heuristic. I don't know, but I feel like Adam Grant or someone mentioned this. But one of the big determinants to to an engineer's success in all these big firms was whether they used Chrome or Safari. Yes. And when they dug into it, it's that the the Chrome users had to question a default. It's not that Chrome is superior, but it's that those are the kind of people who they exercise agency. They are installing the browser that works for them as opposed to people who just accept the default have maybe they like Safari. So no, don't mean to throw shade on Safari, but perhaps they have less agency. So yeah, it's that's, about so, questioning. So, but, Anna, what you could do is you can look and see are, are folks using the default, you know, applications or have they upgraded? OK. And what do you think about Bill's question? Is there something, a, a frame or a reminder that someone can invoke to to kind of to 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 dispel the tendency to slip back into contributor mode. Yeah, I, I think um, the first would be to recognize that these are modes, not characters. So you know, I, I did the research right, like people that managers identified as impact players versus what I came to call ordinary contributors. And yes, there are people who kind of fall into those buckets at times, but they're really modes of thinking and working that we move in and out of. Right. And I love his question because it says like, kind of, I've got the heart and soul of an impact player. Like I've worked this way, but I feel myself like having slipped into turning a crank, going through the motion. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way out of that is to recognize that it is a mode. It's not you, it's a mode you've gotten into. And to, I like to think about it as muscle memory. Like, can mm -hmm. you remember a time when you were working a different way? What were you doing differently? And invoke that like, oh yeah, this project. And, and to go back to doing those things. And, you know, if I had to maybe suggest like a reminder, a prompt to oneself, it's probably the thing that if I could like stand on a tall building and scream out, I don't know, career advice to people. It would be that everything I've seen in my research is that we have far more power than we think. Mm -hmm. We get into organizations, we're like, oh, I'm the new, I'm the intern, I'm the new person. I've been given this, you know, that's not my job. Like, it's easy to assume that we are powerless. Right. And in this research, what I found is like what managers want are people who take charge, who don't yeah. wait to be told, who figure out what the problem is. Oh, by the way, I just took the liberty of doing this. Oh, you were mumbling about the VR. You know what? Like we, it is our work. It's not our boss's work. And when we decide that we have, we have a lot of power to decide where we work, what we put our attention on, how we work, it's like taking back that power, um, it's what actually most managers want. Yeah, it's beautiful. I think it's such a great, it's such a perfect note to end on as well, because the reality is there are certain even ways of showing up to the day, right? You know, one of the most, for me, one of the most disempowering ways to start my day is to open my email because it's everybody else's to-do list, right? And if I want to, if I want to greet the day with a renewed sense of agency, I should start with what are the things that are important for me to get done today? Right. Yeah. Not what are the things that others have piled onto my public to do list called email. Right. But what do I want to get done today? Right. And so, Bill, hopefully, hopefully that's helpful uh, mm -hmm. advice from Liz. Liz, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. I, I didn't I've, I've heard from others about your brilliance, but to get to see it firsthand and experience it firsthand, it's a true joy. I love um, hearing about your uh, your your problems with your own idea flow or your gift in idea flow yourself. <laughs> and it's fun to have it to have a fellow idea uh, connoisseur. And, I'm a, a um, junkie. I'm a junkie. It's fun to be with a fellow junkie. Definitely. But the best leaders maximize intelligence, innovation, idea flow, ownership in other people. And if we want other people to go big, sometimes we have to play a little bit smaller. Mm. Mm. Well said. Well said. Thank you for joining us today. Everyone who's been watching live. Thank you so much. In two weeks, two weeks and two days, we've got Kevin Kelly joining us as well. Or no, one week and two days. We have Kevin Kelly joining us talking about his book, Advice, Excellent Advice for Living. So tune in there. Until next time, thank you so much. Have a great day.